Uh, I'm journalier Marcy Akaba, the CHCI Conical Phil Phillips um, Public Policy Fellow. Uh, I am delighted to be with you today for the What's New in Health Technology session. Um, as we know, technology and innovation are the bedrock of our society, and there are new technological advances every day that help make our lives safer and easier. Uh, on behalf of CHCI, I would like to thank Grail, Apple, and the American Cancer Society uh, Cancer Action Network for their generous support of this session. Uh, it is my honor to introduce welcoming remarks from Session Chair Representative Andrea Salinas. Um, Representative Salinas was elected in 2022 to represent the people of Oregon's six districts. She is a proud daughter of a, of a Mexican immigrant, a first generation American, and dedicated public servants. Uh, she serves on the Committee on Agriculture and the Committee of, on Science, Space, and Technology. Congresswoman Andrea Salinas, I give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and thank you to CHCI for this opportunity to be with all of you this morning. Um, so I'm excited to be kicking off this panel on such an important topic. Um, something that wasn't mentioned, I actually served as the chair of the House Health Care Committee in Oregon for um, a couple of sessions, and then I stood up the first behavioral health care um, committee on the House side. So, so this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. I was the chair during COVID, um, and it was a rough time. So we know that advancement can come with some risk, and while technology's potential to actually improve health equity is great, so is the potential for disenfranchisement, and underserved communities um, can see this firsthand. But that doesn't mean we don't innovate. What it means is that we do so in a thoughtful, intentional way to really ensure that we don't leave anyone behind, including our Latino community. And just to illustrate what I mean by this, I do want to use COVID and the example that I saw in Oregon um, and Oregon's technological response to COVID. So in Oregon, our Latino community comprises 13% of the state population. Yet during COVID, we made up about 40% of all COVID cases at the height of the pandemic. And several factors contributed to this disproportionate case rate, but one of the driving factors was actually the state's reliance on smartphones, social media, and the internet to communicate with this population when most of our farm workers, were, they still relied on flip phones, radio, and word of mouth for their healthcare news and updates. So this was not meeting people actually where they were. Technology helps us collect data on race, ethnicity, language, disability, sexual orientation, and gender identity, all of which are really critical and essential for understanding lived experiences and really tailoring communication. And in doing so, we can advance treatment and actually expand access to care. And as policymakers, we can use this information to drive public health decisions, innovate, and direct investments. So many in our community have seen the benefits of integrated platforms, allowing for secure access to healthcare from the comfort of their homes. I don't know how many of you are, you know, can, can use my chart or telehealth to see, you know, different doctors. And telehealth has certainly broadened access to care across the country, including in some of our rural communities. However, it's also laid bare the serious consequences of insufficient broadband access proving that a lack of technological development in our communities can literally be bad for your health. So thinking more technically though, the advancement of precision medicine, which is an exciting idea, and I think you know, we're on the cutting edge right now, and you all know that tailoring treatment to the specific genetics of a patient is exciting, but again, we must make sure that this technology is formulated based on a representative population, reflecting the diversity of our country, starting with inclusion of Latinos in clinical trials. I mean, we have all heard that even um, heart attacks and heart health is really based, and the, you know, the, the data on it is based on a white male population. And so as we move forward with you know, precision genetics, we have to think of larger populations. So what I'm personally most invested in is seeing how technology can help drive consistent care in our Latino and underserved communities who all too frequently 
don't even consistently see a primary care physician or the same primary care physician. So integrating systems and using technology can help really close this gap. And when you take a step back, it's undeni undeniable that technology is improving healthcare in so many ways, from wear wearable devices to clinical trial participation to apps for tracking and, and improving treatment. And as a policymaker who's passionate um, and an advocate about improving access to healthcare and lifting up the Latino community, I'm inspired for what the future of healthcare holds for all of us. And I look at I look really forward to hearing from our experts today. So I just want to, again, thank you, and I'll turn it over to our moderator and panelists. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman Andrea Salinas, for those amazing remarks. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Ben Leonard. Um, ben is a health technology reporter for Politico. Um, he covers digital health action from DC at agencies, uh, in Congress and in the White House, as well as the industry at large. He's also a co-author of Politico's um, Future Pulse newsletter. Um, everyone please welcome up to the stage um, Ben Leonard. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, ben Leonard, as uh, he said, um, very pleased to be here today. And um, thank you to Representative uh, Salinas for the introduction um, and kind of setting the context for our conversation. Um, and thank you to the Con Congressional Hispanic Caucus, Caucus Institute all for having us all here. Um, as he said, I'm a health tech reporter at Politico. I cover you know, how technology is really fundamentally reshaping healthcare, um, whether it's through telehealth, m more care moving into the home, um, precision medicine or artificial intelligence. Um, we, I focus on sort of the future of healthcare and where that's going. Um, the pandemic response, the pandemic and the response to it has really revolutionized how we deliver care in this country and our team's been paying very close attention to that. Um, and you know, there's a lot of excitement about the innovation that's going on. Um, we're gonna dig into some of those changes today, um, some of the positives and some of the negatives that have come with it, particularly in Latino communities. We'll grapple with health, health disparities, uh, unequal uptake of technology, barriers to access, and lack of trust in the system. We'll also talk about some of the potential policy solutions and what health systems, health tech firms have been doing uh, with respect to technology. Um, lawmakers have really been focused on digital health and integrating technology better into healthcare. They extended hospital at home care and telehealth coverage in Medicare through the end of 2024. And it's become a really strong bipartisan issue in a divided Congress. Uh, when I talk to lawmakers on, in the hallways of Congress, they're always happy to talk about telehealth. Um, other issues, not quite as much. Um, and you know, they're really excited about digital health. Um, and you know the technology's potential, but they're also aware of some of the potential issues, including bias and the di digital divide. Um, so the Hill's really looking at that. Um, and we have a great group of panelists here that I want to introduce. Um, we have uh, Jorge Rodriguez, a clinician investigator at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And um, next we have Wayne Lillistrom, um, the field medical director at Grail. Um, Lauren Chung, a physician at Apple, and finally, James Williams Jr. of the American Cancer Society's Cancer Action Network. And uh, before we get started, a reminder to everyone, um, feel free to um, tweet your comments about the, about the session at CHCI Summit, hashtag CHCI Summit. Um, so just to start out, you know, the pandemic was a pretty big accelerant of change in the healthcare system. The federal government opened up a lot of regulations to keep people safe, get care at home via telehealth, um, and sort of slow the spread of the virus. Um, a lot of people I've talked with say it's moved the system forward even as much as a decade in terms of technology. Um, so to start out, I wanted to ask each of you sort of, you know, what do you think are the most significant changes to the healthcare system during the pandemic, especially with respect to tech in the Latino community? Uh, but yeah, I can go. I, I think for me as a, a clinician, um, you know, one of the things I often reflect on is that in the healthcare system, if you try to get anything done over a weekend, it like never happens, right? That's like just doesn't happen, moves slow. But with a COVID, one thing we were able to do, literally, if you look from a Friday, we were primarily delivering in-person care. By that next Monday, we were primarily delivering telehealth care. And so that's sort of like the big change that kind of 
was driven all by the pandemic and really showed when like you identify a clear use case for technology and you say like this is a need that we have, you can really apply it in an effective uh, format. I think that was one, one change. And the other change that I think was it came out of the pandemic was also the, um, it made kind of digital inclusion and digital uh, uh, equity uh, more evident, right? Like even from, the, from the, the, the High Tech Act back in like 2010, 2009, when like patient portals and patient facing tools became like a really big part of the way we delivered care, we knew those disparities and those inequities were there, but we were kind of, we, we thought we had time, like, oh, we're eventually gonna get to it, we'll get there. And then once this kind of change happened from Friday to Monday, we were like, oh, we gotta get this done now. So I think it's kind of really brought a good sort of general focus, policy focus on digital equity it was a kind of a, the big changes that I saw at least. I'd add, um, as, so I'm trained as a biochemist, uh, what we saw was this tremendous advancement in the delivery of vaccines. So RNA vaccines uh, would, had been developed as potentially the war against cancer. They were quickly shifted into fighting this pandemic. Uh, and so that became available what now seems like night over day. And then secondly, all the at-home testing, right? Now it's ubiquitous to us to be tested for COVID at home. I remember that came very quickly as well. So the delivery of healthcare, and to, to follow up on your point, outside of the clinic uh, through vaccination programs are available almost everywhere as well as, you know, testing yourself for disease at home. I'll add to that, I mean, same as what they've said, but I think the single biggest advancement was really the adoption and the, the improvement and adoption of telehealth across the country. So as you all may recall, before the pandemic, telemedicine wasn't really accepted. Right. It would been around for years, but both patients and providers alike were really reticent to use it, oftentimes because they didn't trust that they could deliver the same type of care within the community as they did in a clinical setting. And that was really unfortunate because it's really difficult to get in to see your doctor, both from the time it takes to go to the doctor's office, to wait there, and also to just schedule an appointment. Um, and what we really saw is, as, as you said, I actually believe that it did accelerate the field by about a decade. But now we're seeing that people are actually able to get care in the home through things like FaceTime. I think not, you know, that, that's really helped um, connect patients with providers, but also that providers are willing to accept data that was collected outside of the clinical setting and use it in the way that they care for their patients. And so we've been inspired by stories around how FaceTime's been adopted in the ECG app to allow us to make meaningful use of the technology to care for patients um, in the clinical setting, but from home. Yeah, and I would just add, I mean, every one of my, my colleagues, I'm not a colleague, I'm, I don't have a doctorate, but <laughs> if we were on the stage today, uh, I would add to exactly what they said. But the big thing, I believe, from the American Cancer Society, Cancer Action Network perspective, is we were concerned that there would be a lack of screening. That is, a lack of screening, people putting off exams, and all those sort of things. And so I think now, uh, there's an old song that said, if you, you dance to the music, you gotta pay the piper. I think we're seeing that now. And with young people having high rates of colorectal cancer that we never, ever experienced before. So that's a, that was one thing that we were concerned about, and that was something that we uh, worry about to this day. And the other is, as the doc, as doctor said, that. Um, uh, you know, the, I, I think that a lot of people take for granted that the United States was able to go from zero to 60. I'm talking about with regard to a vaccine in, what, a year or so? When the previous record was like four years, and it used to be many, many years in advancement. So that's all because of the techno technological advances that, uh, that I, I would say the United States made pre pre uh, before that with the research to or the AIDS vaccine. Not AIDS, but with regard to AIDS. If we did not do all of that computer modeling and all those sort of things during the AIDS uh, 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 pandemic, epidemic, I'm sorry, we would not have been ready for this pandemic and come up with a vaccine that so quick, that quickly. And that's where modern technology got us so quickly today. But we're concerned about the screening rates. That was something that did not happen during the pandemic. We're glad that people are getting screened now, but that was something that we were really concerned about. And the numbers in young people being affected by colorectal cancer are proof positive of that. Yeah, to your point, Lauren, about um, you know telehealth not being uh, you know super accepted. It was in the Medicare program. You actually had to drive to a facility um, to actually go eat, access telehealth, um, and you know obviously that's changed now. Um, so I just thought that was um, interesting. Kind of shows how far we've come. Um, 
uh, and I'll turn to you now, Wayne. You know, as we've discussed, there are obviously a lot of new types of technology that have been bridging gaps and expanding access to care. You know, what's your company looking to do, and how do you think it will aid Hispanic communities? Great question, Ben. Um, and to follow up on what you said, James, uh, we saw that too. So the pandemic gave us all these new technologies. It made it much more difficult to get into the clinic, and about 10 million people, by 2021, 10 million people had missed their guideline recommended cancer screens. Uh, we stopped looking for cancer. Cancer did not stop looking for us. And now we're seeing all these late stage cancers that are affecting people of various ages. What we've done at GRAIL uh, throughout these past several years is develop a novel technology called multi-cancer early detection. Uh, believe it or not, with a, now a single blood draw, we take two vials of blood, we can screen for over 50 different types of cancer. It has some important characteristics. Uh, the blood is stable at room temperature for up to a week after it is drawn. Um, it, it has an artificial intelligence component. So it has literally found in our clinical studies and now in the real world, it has found cancers that it has not been trained on. Um, and thirdly, it's, we're, we're working hard to make it available to as many different communities across the United States as possible. So it's supported by over, uh, by currently we have over 300,000 patients in our clinical studies in the United States, the United Kingdom. Uh, we're seeking FDA approval, and with it, we hope to help as many people as possible, especially those that need it the most, like Latino communities across the United States. Okay. Yeah. And moving to you, Lauren, can you tell me a little bit more about your vision at Apple and what you think, how you think the Apple Watch can sort of make a difference here? Yeah, so last summer we released a health report that details out the many different ways that we are working with the medical community, but also with uh, consumers themselves to improve access to care and to their health information. Uh, there were so many good examples in that um, that the report ballooned to about 40 pages. So I'm going to do my best to summarize that quickly here. <laughs> our goal has always been to empower our users to be at the center of their health and to live a better day by providing them with actionable science-based insights with privacy at the core. We offer features in 17 different areas of health and wellness, ranging from medically regulated apps like the ECG app and the irregular rhythm notification, all geared at helping people understand if they have atrial fibrillation to apps like cycle tracking and sleep tracking, um, which are wellness apps that really help people better understand their everyday health. Um, when it comes to health as a physician, I know that much of your health is built up of your everyday habits, like if you're getting enough sleep or if you're going out for a walk. And those actions really add up to provide really positive big impacts for a user's health. With the watch, users are able to get insights into their health as well as their everyday habits, which helps them better understand what they need to do for their own health, and also helps them understand when they may need to go have a conversation with their own physician. Um, we like to say that we sweat the details so that you don't have to, and so we dive really deeply into the science. That means looking at the research, looking at the data, and doing our own studies to ensure, you know, for over months and years that we can compare our features to ground truth. And the other thing that I want to touch on is just privacy, which is that we really believe that privacy is a fundamental human right, and so you should expect from your devices the same sort of confidentiality as you can expect from your doctor. And that is something that we provide and are very proud to provide on our, on our devices. Um, and so we're, we're in the early innings of our journey in health. Um, who knows what we'll uncover along the way, but we're really excited about those new innovative features that we have for everyone. Thanks for that. Um, and shifting gears a little bit, um, you know, Latinos have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, but obviously part of a larger you know, issue with health disparities, you know, more likely to be uninsured and higher risk of developing diseases like diabetes, for instance, uh, just some of the examples. You know, what are some of these fundamental factors here um, for any of you all? What are the, some of the, you know, fundamental factors that are driving some of these health disparities here? You know, I think that some of the fundamental factors with regard to the healthcare divide between Latinos, ethnic minority, other ethnic minorities is racism. I mean, unfortunately, you know, if you're, uh, if you're an African-American woman, you are three times more likely to die from childbirth because you're an African-American woman. That's just, that's re with without regard with how much money you make or your income or your, uh, uh, how much money or your uh, academic status. And, um, but, I, but what I am happy to say is that, you know, today, I think that we are more aware of these challenges and we're working head 
head first to try to address them. I know that the American Cancer Society, that's one of our pillars to, to address the healthcare divide between Latinos and everyone else in the United States. Because when healthcare improves for Latinos, for indigenous, for African Americans, for Asian Pacific Islanders, it, it improves for everyone. It makes the thing make things better for everyone. And once we get, I think, out of this zero sum mentality that if it's good for this group of people, then it's got to be taken from someone else, then that's where we uh, uh, are moving forward. And I have to say that that's something that um, the American Cancer Society are working with, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, the Asian Pacific Islander Caucus, the Congressional Black Caucus, and also the Native American Caucus to work in a way that they define how we address that. Uh, and I finally say that um, the uh, American Cancer Society, we have a whole Henrietta Lacks outreach um, that deals with not just African Americans, with everyone to protect the privacy of your in information and also to make sure that we address that divide and it's only going to be addressed if we do it directly. But I think that you know other things notwithstanding, it's unfortunately the, you know, the, 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 the thing that has always been holding back this nation from so much of its greatness is unfortunately racism. Um, and res with respect to you know, technology and the digital divide, it's you know, often brought up um, with respect to health tech. Um, for example, there was one HHS study that found um, Latinos were the, uh, by far the lowest um, group, or group that used video-enabled telehealth the least out of um, other racial groups. Um, you know, I guess what are sort of the factors at play here in, in that and some of these digital divides that we've been seeing? I can, I can chime in. I, I, think I'll, I think when most people think of, of this stuff, you probably think about like internet and device. So I will, I will not yeah. touch upon that, but rather I'll, I'll highlight a couple of other, other pieces. I think one, especially for Latino populations, is the importance of kind of language concordant care, right? And so when you think about the way we develop in the healthcare system, that we have this increasing conversation that we're a digital first healthcare system. We're creating a digital front door, right? But when you go to your digital front door, I encourage you at some point to go to your healthcare system, go to your patient portal, and see what language is it available in. For a good chunk of them, right. it's English only, right. maybe Spanish, but otherwise, so what does it mean when we say like we're a digital first, digital front door first, but the digital front door is not available in your language. I think that's one piece of the, one piece of the, uh, of the puzzle. Um, and then the other piece of the puzzle that I'll highlight um, is the role of, uh, uh, in the plenary, they talk about uh, redlining, redlining, but also the role of like digital redlining and the role that internet service providers, it was a really nice uh, piece done by this uh, group called The Markup, where they highlighted that depending on what neighborhood you lived in, you got the same internet speed, but at wildly different costs. And often the places that were getting charged more for their internet were places where marginalized populations lived. And so how do we address that when you, I'm a healthcare system trying to deploy this really great remote monitoring program, but my community is gonna struggle to just kind of pay for the internet piece. And there's some policy pieces that have tried to address that, but those are the kind of two kind of additional things that I'll add in addition to the kind of device and internet piece. I guess taking a step back, you know, what are sort of healthcare organizations doing to address some of these uh, digital equity barriers and, you know, are there areas where they can be going further? I can chime in. Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, at Grail, we see that the, there, there is this divide in who is getting screened and who is not. And we've approached it through um, several different uh, um, problem solving skills because it is a multivariate problem. So what we see is there's a language barrier. Uh, there are cancer screening deserts both in inner cities as well as rural communities. And there's this lack of trust amongst uh, many minority populations, including uh, Latin American populations. Uh, for new technologies, right? Why would someone want to give you know, their blood for a clinical study or to get screened with something they don't fully understand? So to follow up on your point, um, we had just this past week we had discussions that someone goes to our patient portal um, and instead of being educated, um, in, in the past I should say, instead of being educated about what the screen is in layman's terms, you know, in easy to understand language, in Spanish or other languages that are commonly spoken across the United States, they're hit with the safety information up front, right? And so how do we help them better understand the technology? We do this through education initiatives across the country. We do this uh, through outreach specifically, and we're working in, in conjunction with the American Cancer Society, yes. um, and specifically looking at communities with disparities as care, uh, including um, uh, Hispanic and Native American communities in, in New Mexico, as well as California. Um, and finally, we've set a goal. 
in this goal, we have very large clinical studies at Grail, 20, 50,000 people, year more is not uncommon for us. Within that goal, we want to enroll at least 20% minority populations to each one of these big clinical studies. So we build the trust through education, and then we build the data that this should work equally, hopefully, across all, all communities, because we actually have the clinical data from our clinical studies. Um, what I will add to that is that you know education and, and being able to communicate with individuals is a really important aspect of it, but it's also being able to communicate actually culturally appropriate care to them. Mm -hmm. right. As Representative Salinas had mentioned, Traditionally, this population has largely been understudied. They haven't been represented in research studies. And when they haven't been represented in research studies, that means that the findings of those studies really don't generalize to that population. Right. And so they're getting interventions that aren't really geared towards the best care for them. And so what I think digital technologies have a really uh, amazing opportunity to do is to improve the access to those research studies and allow us to include more diverse populations within research. And so if you look at traditionally the research that's been done, I'll give you an example, which is the Women's Health Initiative. Many of you may have heard it. It's a landmark groundbreaking study around women. But even in that study, only about 3% of the population were identified themselves as Spanish, Hispanic, or Latino. And then the nurses' health study similarly said that 97% of their population, the research population, is white. What we've seen in the Apple Women's Health Study, which is this longitudinal groundbreaking study that we've been doing in partnership with the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, is to make a longitudinal digital study that makes it easier for everyone, wherever they are, to enroll in a study and provide and decide to provide and share their data with the research teams. And so in our methods paper, we were able to show that 12% of the population is is saying that they are Latino. And so that is just a really great first step in making sure that they're included in the research that then leads to important discoveries about how we're going to care for them. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to add what Dr. Lawrence said is that what, what she's saying, this is not recent. I mean, it, it, it's recent. I mean, I'm, I'm 63, I know I don't look it, but I mean, <laughs> the thing is that um, when I was a young Hill staffer in 1991, uh, then chairman of the House Appropriation Subcommittee on Labor, HHS, Lou Stokes, said at a very simple, at a, okay, how, are you, for these numbers, for these statistics, are you doing anything other than white men? And the answer was no. And so um, his then colleague, Kika De La Garza from Texas, um, said, hey, you know, we need to do this for, make sure that this is inclusive of everybody, because that's the problem. We've been getting bad numbers. You know, these numbers have all been applied for white men. And now you see it uh, being broad, but I'm just saying that this is, um, it, it, it's something that is a recent, it's recent for me, but it's like, like within the last 30 years that this has been, it, was, it went from white men to white men and white women. And then now you've seen more inclusive uh, uh, numbers when it comes to this type of research. So I just want to emphasize what Dr. Lauren said. Yeah, on clinical trials during the pandemic, you know, there's been a lot of push for, you know, more diversity in clinical trials and also, um, you know, the pandemic uh, facilitated access to sort of decentralized clinical trial models. Um, you know, I guess what sort of ways can we, you know, make clinical trials and research more, more inclusive? You start or should I? Uh, Go for it. I'll jump in. Uh, one thing is communicating in a culturally sensitive manner, right? So, um, uh, again, at Grail, we have all our standard clinical study documents, you know, what this trial does, what the goals are. They're obviously available in English. We've looked at, you know, let's translate them into Spanish uh, in a, a, a a type of Spanish that is uh, understood by many different Hispanic communities across the country. Smaller things, I remember looking at, at one uh, clinical study document and it had a, you know, cancer is a disease of older people and so it had an older couple walking on the beach. I was, I was thinking, I was, I was communicating with the, with the team, you know, what we need is abuelita and her little kids, you know, at Christmas. That's, you know, something that resonates with the Hispanic community. Why is screening for cancer so important for you um, and how can we help? you know, engender that trust into different communities. So for us, it starts at the basic level, education, being culturally sensitive, and being seen in communities that need cancer screening the most. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, just to add to what Dr. Wayne said, you know, representation matters. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm fortunate in that my two younger, two of my children are fluent in Spanish, but as you were saying, 
uh, there is when when my uh, uh, when our uh, our housekeeper would take them to their neighborhood. They said they don't speak Spanish like they learn Spanish in the school book. They speak Spanish like we speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what he's saying. And representation matters. Um, and and in, in clinical trials, that's what we're encouraging at the American Cancer Action so Cancer Society Cancer Action Network to make sure that representation is there. And I'm glad to see that during the research for the um, uh, vaccine that ended up uh, uh, fighting. Uh, COVID that we had um, uh, we had trials going on at HBCU medical schools and we had Dr. Kizmekia Corbett who was one of the lead uh, researchers behind that because when you see someone who looks like you and who speaks your language who understands your culture that goes a long way in addressing clinical trials and you know um, the American Cancer Society we're working on legislation to make sure that individuals who want to participate in clinical trials can be recompensated for their travel and their time uh, because mm -hmm. it, it costs money to be in a clinical trial and making sure that you're reaching those rural communities because too often when people think rural, they don't think Latino. They don't think African American. African Americans and Latinos live in rural communities too. So that's something that you know we've been doing an aggressive outreach to make sure that that happens. And it goes back to what Dr. Uh, what Mark Wayne was saying about that. Yeah. It may also not be intuitive. I think it's really important that we also share back the results of the mm -hmm. findings with the community. Right. You know, there's a lot of distrust when it comes to participation in these studies. And so yes, it's important that we make sure that they can be included included in the studies, but that they also understand what their data is leading to, the findings that they that they are are helping to facilitate. So I know in our Apple Women's Health and actually all of our public studies, we make it a point to make sure that we provide what we call study updates to any of the users who participate so that they can see the actual findings that their data has contributed to, so they can feel good about the fact that they're actually making a difference. And Wayne, um, I want. I know you pointed to stats about um, you know how cancer is the leading cause of death mm -hmm. for Hispanic people, one in five deaths. Um, you know, why is this happening, and what can be done about it? Of course. Um, unfortunately, over the course of our lifetime, forty to fifty percent of us will be diagnosed with cancer. Uh, we can't stop it from happening, but what we hope to do is detect it as early as possible um, to lead to improved outcomes. In Hispanic communities and communities of color across the United States, uh, there are several variables. And uh, the, the, answer, the, the question is a very broad one, um, but economic factors. We, we spoke about um, uh, language barriers, and then we also spoke about uh, access to care, right? So inner cities and rural neighborhoods uh, often don't have the same access to care that we do in, in more affluent areas of the country. We've taken a, a multi-pronged approach, and I'll, I'll tell you something that's already in place uh, in the United Kingdom, where there's also different areas of the country that different, have different access to care. Because we've developed a blood-based technology, you can actually put a mobile clinic in the back of an 18-wheeler, and that's what we did there. We, we took the care to the community, and we literally parked it around different areas in the United Kingdom in order to enroll as diverse a patient population as possible. 140,000 people were enrolled in that study over 10 months. Uh, the only study that may have enrolled more quickly um, is the polio vaccine uh, in the 1950s and 60s. So it's a tremendously successful approach. Here, we've had similar conversations. How do we best serve the community? And to, to your point, James, um, we had uh, one community in Arizona where um, the, the, the idea was initially can we um, bring the patients to the clinic? Take the, take the bus to the patients and, and, and bring them back to the clinic. One well, alternative approach is give the, the participants in the study a gas card. So if they're gonna go into town, their gas is paid for, they can you know, participate in the study and get other things done, mm -hmm. right? And they're not behold to the bus. And so those are the ways we try to answer these questions is what is the best approach to help the communities in care um, again, through, um, through culturally sensitive and appropriate manners. And it's actually, it, it takes a lot of thought, and we're getting there. Yeah. Representative Salinas touched on this a little bit, but what do you all think sort of the future of healthcare looks like for those who aren't tech savvy or may not have access to uh, stable internet? It's going, it's, it's going, it's a difficult, it's, it's going to be tough. I mean, you know, let's not, you know, 
30% of rural communities do not have access to the internet. And in some inner city areas, 30% of cities don't have access to the internet. Or as you know, I think Dr. Rodriguez, or maybe Wayne, you may, we pointed it out, even if you have access to the internet, it's a disparate impact type of situation. For those who don't know, disparate impact is a policy that while facially neutral, actually ends up discriminating. If you can't afford a $100 or $150 bill to have the minimum speed of the internet, you know you don't have internet access, even though technically you have access to it. It's going to be tough. That's something that you know we have to in holistically address the availability of having internet access. So because that's clearly where we're going, it's you know it's more access to more individuals to be able to see your doctor as opposed to waiting a couple of weeks. Oh, you can meet with the clinician here, and that's all wonderful. But we have to figure out a way to make this more accessible on a realistic manner to all of our um, uh, citizens in the United States and to everybody in the United States. Yeah, it's a it's a big that's a big challenge, Brad. Yes. And I know, you know, as more healthcare is moving digital, more people are using telehealth. Some have raised concerns about, you know, the lack of, you know, seeing your doctor in person, you know, mm -hmm. the personal touch, and maybe not having a strong relationship. You know, what sort of strategies can we ensure to make to use that we ensure we have, you know, relationships with our providers as we move more and more into virtual care? I think a lot of it has to do with kind of balancing and providing that hybrid care. I had a really, um, I'm working with a group of uh, Latino patients with diabetes, and uh, we're having kind of these interviews where we're asking them about their perspective on telehealth. And so I had this one patient, always sticks out for me. She was able to list for me all the different benefits of telehealth. Oh, yeah, I save on parking, I'm to drive, it's like the best thing ever. And I'm like, all right, well, how about next time you go to your you know, visit, they offer you a video visit, would you take it? She's like, oh gosh, no, I love my doctor. I want to see them in person, I want to say hello. And exactly. Like, yeah. And so I think it's, it's balancing that hybrid care and knew, knowing when the right, but then we asked her a bit more. She was like, oh, if I, see, if I was seeing like a specialist that I might just see once or twice, then I would use it. So I think it's just kind of balancing that piece of like knowing when it's the right time to kind of use the tool and when maybe the in-person care. And I, th and I think we had the reality that came into me, like even for that patient, if I provided, internet, device, digital literacy, trust, all the different pieces that we talked about, her preference was like, I just want to see my doctor and like hang out, shake their hand and right. give them a high five or whatever it is. So I think the importance of like patient preference and I think patient choice also comes into play as we kind of develop all of these, uh, all these tools and try to maintain the, the reason like we, we all went into healthcare or I went into medicine was like the relationships I build up with patients and not letting, you know, using technology as a way to strengthen that and not letting it kind of like separate us a, a little bit, which can be Kind of tough, and then from a clinician side, I'd say that we have probably lots of work to do, or some work to do in terms of like one of my colleagues calls it website manner, just developing on at least on video visits to be able to deliver care in a way that's like you're still building up that kind of connection as you would in, in person. Right. Yeah, I just want to just buttress what you said, Doctor. Um, you know, one thing that I believe, while we have many things in common, I'm talking about we being African Americans in the Latino community. One thing we definitely have in common is our distrust of doctors in mm -hmm. general. And you, I mean, when I was out trying to sell the vaccine to African Americans. Americans, the first thing you hear, oh, what about the Tuskegee answer? I mean, you know, oh, wait a minute, let's back up. You know, that wasn't about getting a vaccine, it's about not getting a vaccine, but let's not quibble over that little historical fact for a second. But once I believe that, I believe the hybrid model is working because what I have been doing on my individual level, when I have relatives who had that type of distrust, I found a doctor that they could trust. A doctor, sometimes it looked like them, sometimes it didn't. But once they had that initial meeting with that person, then they would have a telehealth and it worked out fabulously because now they could get in touch with her or her team far easier than having to schedule a regular appointment that would take maybe a week or a month before you were able to see that person. And there are just some exams you gotta be, I mean, you can't do a pelvic exam over the internet. You gotta be there for that. Mm -hmm. So there are some exams that are gonna, you have to be there for. So um, yeah, it's, in our case with ACS CAN, we just emphasize, get screened get tested as soon as you can and you know find a physician that you're comfortable with and then from that point uh, you know telehealth works but you have to initially establish that connection especially for ethnic I believe minority communities yeah there's been some, some interesting polling on that it's actually showing you know people do like to go in person for some things you know the more you know intensive things but love telehealth for right. say you know getting your prescription refilled like who exactly. wants to go back to the doctor mm -hmm. to, <laughs> right. to do that and so um, and it, 
uh, seems to be playing out, and, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. broadly. Um, I guess shifting gears a little bit, we are in Washington, so we're going to talk about the policy. Um, you know, the federal government did a lot to expand access to care, uh, especially, uh, especially via technology during the pandemic. Um, you know, how have some of these policy decisions impacted digital uh, health equity efforts for healthcare organizations? Well, I'm glad to say that um, under uh, the, in, the, uh, the, invest, the um, Inflation Reduction Act, we've seen broader access to internet. That's one big key thing that we've seen that's happened. And during the last Congress, we were this close to getting the Medicare Multi-Cancer Early Detection Screening Act signed in and add it as part of the year-end package, okay? That's a big mouthful to go back to what Wayne said. Uh, from a single blood draw, you can detect up to 50 cancers. And so we're pushing that legislation. It's legislation that the American Cancer Society fully endorses and supports. Um, why do we do that? Because um, what the bill will do, long story short, is it will provide a pathway for once it gets past FDA approval, once it gets past CMS approval, for Medicare to consider um, uh, a Medicare multi-cancer screening as part of its package. Now, you, now it's available now, but it's very expensive. It, once Medicare covers it, then it's going to be available to all individuals, in particular Latino, African American, other ethnic minorities, or people who simply don't have the money. It can be available to those individuals. And, and I mean, I, I have said this before, and I'll say it again. I believe that once this bill is signed into law, and I believe it's going to be passed and signed into law, the 118th Congress, um, this bill, will, we'll look back on this bill like we look back on the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the 1965 Voting Rights Act. This is a bill that will allow individuals to hear for the first time in their lives, you have pancreatic cancer, oh, guess what, it's stage one, and it's curable, and we can treat it, and we can deal with it, and you can have a high quality of life going forward. It doesn't supplant any of the other coverages that we have. For example, for prostate cancer, mammograms, colorectal, or any other screening pap smears, it doesn't supplant those, but it's a way in which we can now detect up to as many 50 cancers in the very early stages of, um, uh, of, of them, being, of them in, invading your body. That's a big game changer. It's a big saver for America, and it, can all, and it will also bridge the healthcare divide between ethnic minorities and everyone else. It's, 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 that's the, one of the biggest, that's one of our biggest pieces of legislation we're pushing in. Hopefully we're going to get that done, but um, the Inflation Reduction Act, I, hate to, I, I went around. <laughs> the Inflation Reduction Act really did do a lot to help bridge the uh, internet and uh, uh, divide for so many Americans. We hope, and, and you know these things take a while before they get implemented and rolled out. That's just the way life is. So. And I think one, one thing to kind of bounce off that within that was the affordable connectivity program, which I think is sort yes. of a big opportunity mm -hmm. for clinics, academic medical centers. Before, a lot of times when you were thinking about device and internet divides, you were like, how am I, me as a small clinic, am I going to supposed to give like everyone a device when they come to my clinic? I don't have the funds for that. But I think that policy through like sub, $100 subsidy towards devices, $30 towards internet is a really big opportunity that's ongoing now for us to be able to just... Right. You know, sim similar way we screen for other social terms of health, screen for digital needs, and then perhaps refer. Uh, and I, I believe you like the healthcare system as sort of one node that can kind of connect folks to those pieces. So I think it's. I think I, I'm happy right. you brought that up. Absolutely, it's such an important piece. I mean, if, if, if you're really looking at other policies that can advance the field even further, I would say one of the important ones is a new regulatory paradigm. So especially when it comes to technology, we're advancing so quickly that we're not keeping up with the traditional regulatory schemes right. and mm -hmm. ways that they go through traditional approvals. You know, by the time we finished a study, you could have iterated on the software two times. And that's not necessarily on the part of the software that is the underlying algorithms, but rather the experience so that you're updating it to ensure that it is inclusive, that it's able to meet the needs of the folks that are using it. And so a new regulatory paradigm takes into account these rapid development cycles to allow for that new innovation to come out is going to be really important as we move forward. Exactly. Yeah, that's why we want to get this MZ bill done so that the, you know, when, when the technology is there, we're able to get it right there instead of, okay, we have this technology now, we have to wait 10, 15, 20 years before it's available to everyone in the Medicare population. Yeah, and that's where, you know, there was an FDA pre-cert program that we were a part of very early on, but that mm -hmm. has since run out. And so, again, I think 
the, the opportunities to really change how we look at regulating products right. that, and, and ensuring that they're safe, because we want to make sure that they're safe, but that they're also meeting exactly. the needs of, yes. of patients is really important. Yeah, we want it to be safe. We want it to be available. I mean, that's why we want it to go past FDA and CMS approval. We want it to be safe and have a benefit to people. We're not just going out here and just making things up. You're absolutely. absolutely right. So um, now we're going to open up the floor to question and answer for um, anyone that uh, wants to ask questions of our panelists. Hi there. Um, you mentioned Medic, James, you've mentioned Medicare a couple of times, but what about the role of Medicaid and, you know, the cost constraints of state budgets in trying to provide care? How does that play into some of the new technology? I don't have the answer for how it plays into technology right now, but I will tell you that is something that we have been aggressively dealing with at the state level since December. Um, the Medicaid, you know, uh, uh, roll, uh, the rollout or whatever you want to call it, you know, however you call it, we're looking at the largest shift of health care since the Affordable Care Act was founded. Um, you know, we've been alerting states and other individuals, you know, you need to alert your state to try to, you know, do what you can to make sure there is a safety net. And the American Cancer Society has uh, issued letters um, uh, regarding this issue to Congress and, and, and letting them know that this is an issue of significant concern. I don't, I don't know how the, it would affect technology, but I can, all, all I can say is that since December, we've really been concerned about this you know, a pending cliff for over, I think, an estimated 11 million Americans. I do think for those, uh, for Medicaid and for, for really any payer, is that we need to move from the system of covering reactive care to moving towards covering preventive options. Yes. And so we know that lifestyle has a tremendous impact on the health of our population. And we did a study with Vitality that showed that we incentivize people to earn a watch and that if they completed various tasks for their health that we're going to assign to them um, every day that they could actually earn their watch. And through that showed a dramatic increase in the amount of steps taken and the amount of physical activity engaged in and therefore mm. in the, the weight loss that people had and overall just just the health of that population. And so if we were to start thinking about how do we really incentivize preventative health, we can, we can make a big difference in terms of the health of, of different populations across the country. Hola, thank you so much for great um, information on policy, heart disease, diabetes. But what's on my mind is mental health, right? Are there any advancements in technology on mental health is usually a topic that's not covered. I didn't hear it today. And it's really what society can use, you know, driving awareness of it, um, support. So I'm just throwing it out there because I, I haven't heard it at all um, in the sessions I've been in, and society can really use support right now. Absolutely. I'm happy to talk a little bit about what we're doing because we agree with you. It is an extremely important um, area of, of, of uh, health. And so we've been really working with a number of partners across the country to enable better care and better research around mental health. And I'll talk through two studies or projects that we have going. We support uh, the Department of Defense in a study that they're doing for the Marines actually out of USC. And what they do is they provide watches as well as a phone to, um, to veterans, or not veterans, but to, to active military who've been deployed and are coming back to the states. And what they do is actually, they take them through an app, they answer questions, they read articles, they have metrics that are measured on the watch that then helps them understand how are their military feeling? Are they stressed? Are they integrating into their regular lifestyle the way they should? And it's helping them to actually make decisions on whether or not they can redeploy these military members um, or if they need to spend more time at home kind of recovering from the experiences that they had abroad. The second thing that we've been doing is been partnering with UCLA on a study that we call uh, to support their Grand Depression Challenge. And so in that study, they're using iPhone and Apple Watch to better understand signals that can potentially detect depression and anxiety and figure out how to better treat it with active interventions that are delivered through digital devices. And so I think there's a lot about being able to make those types of meditation, mindfulness, you know, well-being interventions available to all, but also as a way to provide increased education um, and support to users. If I can add one thing, actually, too, there's um, been a lot of interest in digital therapeutics also, which are sort of like video games, VR, sort of alternative ways of 
um, treating mental health issues. And um, there's been a push in Congress to get more reimbursement for that. And I think that's something that I've been tracking that's pretty interesting also. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Omar Martinez Gonzalez, AIDS Foundation Chicago. <clears throat> and before I start, I want to thank James for acknowledging uh, the impact of racism in health disparities. Mm -hmm. uh, to that end, AFC has issued a policy statement on racism as a public health crisis because we can't get ahead of it uh, without addressing racism in healthcare. Mm -hmm. And so I look at things from the perspective of people impacted by HIV. And within the field of HIV, there is a movement called molecular HIV uh, surveillance. Uh, which in the simplest terms basically is a means of um, genetically sequencing HIV among newly diagnosed people to find clusters in the community. And the idea is to improve intervention outreach in those communities. Um, but there's a valid fear among people living with HIV that this data could be misused for criminalization. For perspective, um, as of 2022, the CDC states that there are 35 states that criminalize HIV. And so my question is, um, how does the tech sector reconcile the need and desire to create new technological solutions that may improve care and interventions with state laws that criminalize our communities and especially black and Latinx people? I can uh, jump in. It, what we do with the data is uh, very important. And, and what we should do and what um, we shouldn't do varies tremendously between different communities. I'll give you an example. Uh, I was talking to a Native American group in New Mexico, and they said, we, we take two vials of blood, one's a backup, so it can be stored, right, in case something goes wrong with the first one. Uh, the Native American community says they need to know uh, what happens to every piece of their body. And so if it's not used, we need to destroy that sample. Uh, and so this comes to the trust, which is, uh, the, 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 falls under the big picture of trust. Uh, long story short, uh, part of the education program is that if you don't want your sample stored, um, if you don't want your data to be used for additional research be beyond what it was intended, you know, getting screened for cancer in our case, uh, you can quickly call our, our customer service group and they will, they will you know, destroy the sample or do whatever is necessary to meet the needs of different communities. People don't know this is available. That's why education is so important uh, in, in building that trust that, that we've actually taken care of a culturally sensitive approach to, to what is a novel technology? Something people didn't have to worry about in the past. Um, that's, that's what we do at Grill. I was just going to just add that um, yeah, just um, no one should be criminalized for being ill or for getting sick. That is patently wrong. I mean, just again, I, that's just, it's terrible, it's wrong, it should not exist. I'm old enough, when I was nine years old and my mother was diagnosed with ovarian cancer, uh, back then, you didn't even use the word cancer. You just, oh, she's sick, or she's in the hospital, or she'll be okay. When I was in the third grade, I knew she had cancer, but you didn't use the word cancer. Then we finally came around to using, uh, you know, the word cancer. And, you know, I'm old enough to remember when HIV was, you know, oh, don't talk about that, or anything like that. So, first of all, being cr criminalizing an illness is just, in my opinion, that's just terrible, it's wrong, it should never exist in, in the world. Uh, secondly, um, and this may not be an, this may be an incomplete answer to your uh, question, but that's exactly why the American Cancer Society has started uh, in conjunction with Congress, the uh, Henrietta Lacks Institute. For many of you who don't know, Henrietta Lacks was an African American woman who um, had uh, cancer and her cells were used. Uh, against her will. Well, not, not, she never gave consent, but nobody gave consent. And, uh, you know, universities to this day use the HeLa cells to do many things. For example, develop a COVID vaccine, to develop a pap smear uh, technique and other mechanisms. But her family didn't know those are her cells. And it's, I don't believe she ever gave consent for that. There, things have tightened up along those areas. There are ways we need to continue to make that uh, uh, even more, even tighter. Um, because you had Henry and Alax, then you had the Tuskegee situation, and you know after that. But you know things. You know, I, I was I was once chief of staff to Congressman John Lewis, and Mr. Lewis used to say, "If you ever get frustrated or angry, just understand this isn't the fight of a day, a week, or a month. This is a fight of a lifetime. So once we get tight restrictions on your data and on your on, on, on what you want to allow medicine to use, believe me, that's not the end. You have to continue this for generations. But that's the price you pay for 
you know, uh, what freedom, eternal vigilance, I guess, that's what the, the saying, so, you know. I think the, the one thing, I'd, oh, sorry. I, I, would, I was just gonna add in terms of like patient-facing technologies that I think that as a healthcare, as healthcare systems we can do a better job as is having that communication when we're working with like vendors and stuff to say like, what is your privacy policy? Right. Where is that data going? You just recently in the Journal of Health Affairs, there was a publication that came out that showed that like even in po hospital websites, there's like cookies tracking and they track you all in different places. And so mm -hmm. what does that mean? There was a previous study done on like patient portals that shows something similar. Even with some of the COVID apps, like some of that data that was collected was then shared with like a third party. And for, there are all sorts of marginal populations. We've sort of re uh, reflected on the role that might have for uh, undocumented patients. Like you're already having trust in the, in the system to go because of the legal implications. And now you have to worry about like, oh, I used this app, now it's tracked in my location. So mm -hmm. I think not to sound too like, you know, too, too, too wild with it, but I, I think it's a reality of like, there's, there's a power in helping track people, helping people connect people, but there's also these implications that, at least from a healthcare system perspective, we have to understand and know, like, I want to feel comfortable as a clinician being like, we're going to, you know, give you this technology. It's going to track you, but it's going to be going to share between you and I or you and the healthcare system. It's not going to go off to another place. And I think that's an important conversation to have, like, privacy policy, privacy officer, compliance officer, and all those other pieces. I think it gets to the fundamental question of who owns the data, right? right and we, right. we really do believe that it's right. you yourself that should own the data, and that you yourself should have the ability to decide exactly how that data is used. You should be in complete control of it. That's how we've designed all of our products and features with you at the, the center, where you can always decide who you're going to share your data with and what it's going to be used for, and you can always review and revoke those permissions at any time. And I think that really is ultimately the question is, who has access to and can own their data? Um, I think that's all the time we have. Um, wonder I invite um, Congresswoman Salinas up for uh, closing remarks. Well, I want to give this panel a big round of applause. I think you all were fabulous. And for me, I'm so glad I stayed for the entire panel. I mean, you really touched on all of the things that I saw in my district during COVID and the things that I've seen since then. And I think you are all correct in that we really did jump a decade. Um, and I think technology and data is gonna, can be, really be used for good as we move forward. But I think the, the underlying theme that I think all of you brought to this conversation was really around that human element. So whether it was um, trust or regulatory reform, how do we do it in a culturally responsive, culturally sensitive way that really is inclusive and really understands the diversity of the populations we are trying to address? And to continue to ask the questions um, before we make mistakes and trying to get it right, but knowing that if we do make mistakes, we can come back and correct for those. So I just really want to thank all of you for this kind of bigger higher level conversation around what, where we have been since COVID and the potential, which is exciting, and then some of those pitfalls that we could see coming. So thank you. Um, well, thanks so much for making time. And um, just wanted to ask you know, for your closing thoughts, um, you know, biggest takeaways uh, before we head out. Support the Medicare Multi-Cancer Early Detection and Screening Act. Uh, the Nancy Gardner Sewell Bill is introduced by Congressman Jody Arrington and also uh, Congressman, uh, Congresswoman uh, uh, Nancy um, uh, Terry Sewell. It's it's going to be the game changer. So thank you. Yeah, I, I'd say that just you know I'd encourage us to continue to focus on digital literacy as a big component of this. As we have all these conversations about technology and controlling data, a lot of that is understanding what that means. How do we, what does it mean to revoke or you know, accept data, all these different pieces. So I think digital literacy and kind of focusing on that uh, just, you know, throughout our kind of communities is, is an important piece. And James and I, you, you and I are aligned, right? So any uh, multi-cancer detection technology um, that comes to market and is FDA approved and passes the regulatory portals uh, can benefit from the legislation that he mentioned. So, so that's, that's um, a big goal. I'd say it's all on all of us to find ways to be as inclusive as possible in the way that we do our work in health and that we can do that in ways that are responsible and that protect all of you as, as individuals if, when you put privacy in mind um, and that there's this rapid changing technology that ultimately uh, needs to find, we need to find new ways to support in the way we care for people. Yeah. I think the one thing I hear is, you know, to, well, technology is a great tool. It's, you know, only as, as good as, um, you know, it really is. And it, it's about finding sort of the sweet spot for it. 
um, and the and the right use cases is sort of the the, um, the things I heard from this conversation and just generally in health tech. Um, well, thanks so much to everyone for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, this is a great conversation, and um, thanks again to the uh, CHCI for having us all here.